The night has grown longer than the days where I live. Shadows accumulate under the evergreen honeysuckle vines, and in the garden beds where rose bushes and strawberries sleep, dreaming of sunshine. The sun rides low on the horizon to the south, and I usually turn on lamps around four o'clock in the afternoon because it's already getting dark. Sunset is around five o'clock, which makes it feel like we've reached midnight long before we ever get close to it, and we are just days away from winter solstice. There are winter days when the mountains called the Wasatch Front sitting on the west side of the Rocky Mountains are coated in snow, and the patches of the trees on the mountainsides take on a dark purple, the snow a pale tint. The 2022 Pantone color of the year is very peri, 17-3938, but Pantone color 17-3924, lavender violet is a closer color, only it would need to be a darker shade. The true-to-life color is more of a dark, dusty, blue-purple, and in the right conditions, it'll stop you in your tracks. Some days, it's more of a blue-gray. This is in Utah. Depending on where you are in Scandinavia during winter, you may experience shorter days or a polar night, all dark, all the time. Denmark in the south has shorter days, but the countries of Norway, and Sweden, specifically the northern parts of these countries, both cross into the Arctic Circle. Quoting from mprnews.org, NPR Polar Night Winter Darkness Tips, quote, There's about a month bookending the pitch black period on either side where the sun never rises above the horizon. During this period, called civil twilight, the only light in the sky are sunrises and sunsets, and they last for hours, unquote. And if you hear a little snoozing dachshund, Shotzi is sitting right by me as I record. So the next thing I'd like to quote is from seekscandinavia.com, Get Dark Sweden. Quote, when night occurs for more than 24 hours, that is when the sun doesn't rise at all during the day, this is called the polar night. Similarly, days when the sun does not set during summer is known as midnight sun. Both of these occur within the Arctic and Antarctic circles." Unquote. In Svalbard, Norway, the northernmost point of Norway, they wear headlamps during polar night, which is two and a half months long, from mid-November to late January. And they are in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, Greenland Sea, Norwegian Sea and Barents Sea. They are halfway between Norway's mainland and the North Pole. And speaking of the North Pole, it's been dark 24-7 since early in October. Oceanservice.noaa.gov says, An archipelago is an area that contains a chain or group of islands scattered in lakes, rivers, or the ocean. The archipelago is covered 60% by glaciers, and they have been seeing noticeable temperature changes with global warming. I don't know if that would be a relief or you know, a cause for anxiety. Their temperatures are pretty cold. In fact, their summers are like the temperatures right now in Utah during the winter. So their winters are even just super cold. They have 23 nature reserves and seven national parks within the islands. This is also where the Svalbard Global Seed Vault is located, which is pretty cool. On croptrust.org, they say, quote, The Seed Vault safeguards duplicates of 1,194,244 seed samples from almost every country in the world, with room for millions more. Unquote. Summer in Svalbard runs around 37 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, winter in Svalbard is minus 13 down to minus 20, as noted in Wikipedia. It's cold. They go out in twos, the humans that is, and they carry flare guns to scare away polar bears. 
They have to check these at the grocery store when they go shopping. From the stewardship of protecting the Earth's plant seeds in Norway to the pitch black polar nights, trying to Pantone match the mountains in Utah, join me in the Whispering Gallery for Scandinavian Yule card art, which artists are very good at making spirits <clears throat> bright and visible. Are home spirits not spooky enough for you? Just wait for the unsettling Yule Bakken. Join me for some of the spookier side of Yule, coming up next on the Whispering Gallery. Hello, and welcome to the Whispering Gallery podcast. I'm Suzanne Nicolaisen, and I'm glad you're here. Thanks for listening. This holiday season, we are heading north to Scandinavia. I just cranked the heater up a notch. Brr. Last year, we talked about Japanese ghosts. This year, we're going with the Scandinavian house spirit, the Nize. Before we get started, the Danish have a word that you may have heard about, huga. It's spelled H-Y-G-G-E, which is a description of cozy. From ScandinaviaStandard.com, they define it as, huga is about coziness and surrounding yourself with the things that make life good, like friendship, laughter, and security, as well as more concrete things like warmth, light, seasonal food, and drink. Unquote. So, how is the huga of your here and now? If you want to up the cozy a level, turn on a lamp, warm some water for cocoa, pull on another sweater, and here are a couple of huga hacks to take it with you or do at home. Travel mugs for hot cocoa or tea will keep your drink warm longer or let you take it on the go on your commute. Flavored cocoa packets can be slid into your backpack to use wherever you're going. A blanket scarf is useful for your shoulders or lap. It's more portable, and it's one of my favorite things in the winter. A tunic sweatshirt. Thick and soft socks. Your dachshund. Sketchbook and pencil bag. Cozy lamp light. Okay. So you've got your huga rolling, or an idea of how to make things cozy soon? Let's get things started by looking at a map with the mystery of what is Yule and a Yulniz in mind. To the south of Denmark is Germany, which is mainly landlocked, surrounded by the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, France, Switzerland, Austria, Czechia, Poland, and Denmark is on the Jutland Peninsula to the north. The North Sea is to the west, and the Baltic Sea is to the east. And then there are islands, like the archipelago. This is Denmark. And then north of Denmark are Norway and Sweden. Together, they're known as Scandinavia. And it's also argued that Finland and Iceland should be included in this group. So laying some groundwork, a tomta, which is spelled T-O-M-T-E, which Google Translate identifies as Swedish, means Santa in English. Google Translate shares that a gnome is a nisa in Danish, same with elf equals nisa. A gnome or elf is not enough. What is a nisa? Wikipedia writes, a nisa Tomta, Tomta or Tantu, is a mythological creature from Nordic folklore, today typically associated with the winter solstice and the Christmas season. They are generally described as being short, having a long white beard, and wearing a conical or knit cap in gray, 
red, or some other bright color. Better, but Scandification.com shares, quote, In Norway, gnomes are Nisa, creatures that live in barns or homes protecting the countryside and the people who live there. Like Swedish gnomes, Norwegian gnomes are playful figures who can either be pranksters or close friends. Unquote. The research I've done included gnomes, Nisa, and Tomta as part of Christmas in Denmark. In fact, that's how I know about them, internet and researching traditions a few years ago for my family. I've read Tomta are known as Mound Man, House Man, and Nisa are house spirits or household deities. They protect the home and animals, and a house spirit seems to be tied to the hearth or home. In 1976, the Gnomes book, illustrated by Dutch artist Ryan Portvilt and written by Will Hugen, a physician, written somewhat like a science biology book about environment and lives of gnomes and habitat. I got it for Christmas when it was released in English, which was about a year later. The illustrations were painted in watercolor and I would pour over them. As far as picture books went, as you all know, often the illustrations can take you where the words can't. But still the details in the writing were interesting as well. It turned out that these gnomes could blend in as well as James Bond. Don't believe me? One example is that they wore boots that had bird tracks on their soles. So you wouldn't see little boot prints in the snow, just bird tracks. And birds had been there, not gnomes. I have my gnome book right in front of me, and the pages are not numbered, but I'd like to read to you about the footprints the gnomes leave behind. The footprints left behind by a gnome are very distinctive, if you can find them. In order not to leave a trail as he walks along, a gnome makes clever use of pebbles, hard pieces of moss, and pine needles. By stepping on them rather than on the bare ground, he leaves no tracks. Sometimes he walks in a circle or back upon his own trail or proceeds through the trees. If he knows for certain that he is being followed, he will almost always disappear into an underground passage. When forced to tread on bare ground, the gnome makes use of a bird's foot pattern printed in relief on the soles of his boots. With this cunning aid, he disguises his travel. But gnomes sometimes give themselves away by betraying the following small vanity. If you come across a birch leaf on the ground with a clear blob of slime in its middle, you can be sure that a gnome has just passed by and exercised his skill in target spitting. He can't resist proving his aim and thus leaves a trail. That is from the gnomes book about footprints. Okay, one more stab at defining what is a gnome. This is from the Macmillan Dictionary blog.com. Definition 1. An imaginary little man in children's stories who wears a pointed hat and can do magic. 2. A stone or plastic model of a gnome used in gardens for decoration. Origin of the word. The word gnome comes from the medieval Latin term gnomus, which was used by the 16th century Swiss scientist Paraclesis in reference to an elemental creature living on Earth. He may have been inspired by the Greek word genomo, meaning earth dweller, unquote. The Nisa, commonly portrayed in vintage art for holiday cards in Scandinavia, purposefully included in the composition, often as the main subject of the scenes, Nisa. Gnomes are all the rage where I live, with big hats, usually red, shifted down over their eyes, held up by their large nose, huge beards coming down to their stomach. They're currently in style, so to speak, as decor. Not meaning to sound judgy, I've got a few myself. I just pulled them out with our Christmas decorations. We have an heirloom skiing Nisa that's wooden and been around a few generations, it looks like. So, what's the big deal? No, I can't prove there are gnomes or house spirits running around, 
but there are some theories that are interesting to consider. So talking about gnomes may feel safe, even very charming. And like I'm getting lost in Scandinavian legends, what on earth could be spooky? We're here after all for the scary tales, right? I mean, the paintings made into card art often show a happy Nisa with a bowl of hot rice pudding topped with butter. There are things, after all, that might give us pause. The legends are all about them but they are outside of our usual perception, on the outside of our existence, shown in paintings, part of literature, like the ghosts in Dickens' Christmas Carol. there behind the scenes, but you don't want to piss them off by being rude or forgetting your manners. Don't disrespect the gnome. So I can be found binge listening to paranormal history and legend podcasts of unusual modern legends and of the unexplained. Surprise, right? Over the last year, I have heard stories about red caps or gnomes and sightings talked about. If you want more about these sightings, check out Into the Fray podcast. As I considered the compositions of the Christmas card art, it started dawning on me like when you connect the dots of a constellation in a dark midnight sky, that some of our favorite modern folklore, myths, and legends may have some pretty deep roots, maybe in Scandinavian lore. I hope I can explain what struck me about them in this context. It's poke out of the blue. So here we go with the hypothesis. Ha ha. In one painting scene, there's a Nis, a, there's a Nisa, looking into a room through a halfway open door as two children look on, completely unaware that he is there. Another painting shows a bearded Nisa looking in through a home window I'm not sure where the curtains were, because I'm certain, even if the curtains were closed, that the cold would have just dumped into the room from the window. And in these paintings, you'll notice people aren't hanging out by the windows. At our house, the dogs have stopped using a bed under a picture window. I think it's because it's too cold right now. It's on an outside wall. But if you had a gnome looking in your window, maybe that would also be enough to avoid it and shut the curtains. Would your dogs know if a gnome was there? Would they look off into the distance like sometimes they do? Make people think there might be a ghost there? Maybe it's a gnome or a Nisa. Then again, maybe it's a physics thing. Maybe another universe, so to speak. And like with string theory, when the universe folds, who's to say we wouldn't catch glimpses of them? But maybe, and most probably, this is just the artist's compelling illustrations. And the stories say the Nisa is a benign house spirit helping the family, ensuring straw for cows and horses. Super kind, just looking for a little rice pudding once a year with butter. So I've read a couple of versions of this story. What happened was the family put out some rice porridge for the Nisa, and there wasn't any butter in sight. So the Nisa was angry and went and killed their best cow to show them that they should respect him. When the Nisa found the butter at the bottom of the bowl where it had been placed, some say it was a trick by somebody working for the family, some say the farmer had just put it there. Either way, the Nisa felt bad for having killed their best cow, and he went to a neighboring farm and brought a cow back over to replace the one he had killed. They don't say what the neighbors think about their cow going missing, but it does seem that nobody wanted to make their Nisa mad. Just share the butter. 
We have names for things that happen often enough to have caught our attention. Things stemming from keys being lost, glasses misplaced, who ate the last cookie, like Mr. Nobody or even ghosts. What did I mean by modern myths and folklore seeming to be related? Considering these Christmas cards, I was reminded of the topics of many paranormal podcasts covering Shadow People and Glimmer Man in particular. What exactly is a Glimmer Man? From what I've been able to put together, it's a someone, like a person who's mostly invisible, but not 100% so. The tell, so to speak, is similar to how they presented the Predator's camouflage in the movie. Reflective, they blend into the area around them, mostly. There might be a glimmer on occasion of a human shape in an otherwise undisturbed environment. So what's a shadow person? From what I've heard about them, they sound a bit like Peter Pan's shadow in the animated movie, but not 2D, 3D, and aware, sentient, but in shadow form, darker than the area around them, present, like the Nisa looking through the doorway. So I'll run through a few names of Scandinavian artists, and I'll have posted a few of these up on our Facebook group. And I apologize if I, if, when, I should say, I get anybody's name wrong. So, in Norway in particular, Sveen Solem. In Sweden, John Bauer, especially fairy tales, you'll, you may recognize his art. He appears to have influenced Brian Froud's concept art for the Dark Crystal. Jenny Nystrom, also in Sweden. Jan Bergerland in Sweden. And then Norway, Lennart Helge, H-E-L-J-E. So here we are. I told you it was going to get scary, and we're finally going to go there and talk about the Yule Bakken. Pull your sweater closer, because you might just get the shivers. You have probably heard about holidays that have evolved from pagan traditions, like Christmas. So what does pagan mean? Oxford's Learner Dictionary states, quote, 1. A person who holds religious beliefs that are not part of any of the world's main religions. From my understanding, a pagan person might also appreciate some of the truth that they saw in various religions. There might be another definition. This would be pre-Christian celebrations and beliefs. Long ago, there was a tradition of people wassailing, wassail like waffle. The Oxford Dictionary says it's a verb, but what does wassailing mean? Quote, one, drink plentiful amounts of alcohol and enjoy oneself with others in a noisy, lively way. He feasted and wassailed with his warriors, is the example. Number two, go from house to house at Christmas singing carols. Here we go, a wassailing. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> that one. So, here we go, a partying among the leaves so green. As the stories go, these were young men in costume, and one would dress as the Yule Bakken, also known as the Yule Goat. Fast forward, and a male family member would dress up as the Yule Goat. I don't want to think about the nightmares this caused. The human Yule Bakken wore a goat mask with goat horns, cloak from the art I saw. This was a fur. This could look very creepy. If you want to see the drawing of the Yule Bakken that I reference, check out the Whispering Gallery Facebook group. There's also some friendly pictures of gnomes or Nisa and Tomta. Some of the drawings and paintings are spooky. One looked like a pen and ink, and where the goat's head went, it was kind of too flat for a human's head to fit in. I realize they may have been hiding under the um, cloak, but that was very creepy, because it was just like a lump with a, a flat goat's head, and kind of like an Edward Gorey drawing of the creatures that 
didn't exist or hadn't been thought of that he just did. So it didn't really even look like a goat. It was, yeah, um, disturbing. <laughs> Another showed someone dressed up coming in the door with a goat's mask on and the children running to hide under the dinner table. I don't blame the kids at all. It would give you reason to be like, what in the holy Hannah is that going on? So why goats? There's a theory that Thor and his chariot drawn through the sky by the goats Tangrisner and Tangnoster. Sorry if I said that wrong. And his tie to goats, some interesting legends including resurrecting a goat, was somehow rolled forward into traditions. As time passed, the Yule Bakken was replaced by Yule Tomta, who we know as Santa Claus and or Yule Nisa, and the goat became a straw or wooden sculpture tied together with red ribbon. There are large goats on public display, some built from wood and have been set on fire more than one year by arsonists. So why would someone leave a bowl of rice pudding out with a generous pat of butter on Christmas Eve? Preparing for an unseen guest. Someone who is believed to be there. Well, in the United States, we leave out cookies and milk for Santa Claus. The rice pudding is known as, in Danish, Risalaman, Norwegian, Risko, and Swedish, Julgrat, with butter on it. Or sometimes a cherry glaze topping. Without the topping, just the butter, the nisa, have a bowl of it. I've learned how to make rice pudding with Danish dessert raspberry pudding on top. We have a couple of woven paper hearts on the Christmas tree. Things like cross-country skiing. Yes, you can use the skis. No skill or technique was really taught. Just strap those suckers on and go. The Yule Goat today is still part of celebrations. So, while the proof is in the pudding as to if the Nisa are out there or not, it's legend and like it or not, from what I've read, people still put out rice pudding for the Nisa on Christmas Eve with a pat of butter. I've done it before too. Just like leaving out cookies and milk for Santa, I've also done that. Ah! The proof may be in the pudding that's left out, but the evidence of gnomes and Nisa is in the art, stories, and cards of Scandinavia. Thank you so much to Freesound, Google, and Wikipedia in particular for the help on this episode. And I hope you'll join me on Patreon. It means a lot to be able to share all of the little extras with you. The story doesn't really end when the episode does. On Patreon, you'll find a Nisa tale, snickerdoodle recipe that my family uses. That's at patreon.com slash Suzanne Nicolaison Art. S-U-Z-A-N-N-E N-I-K-O-L-A I-S-E-N A-R-T I'd really appreciate it if you have a minute, if you would be willing to rate and review the Whispering Gallery. That would be really helpful. And if you'd like to subscribe, I would love to share more stories with you. I tried to present this information with respect for the cultures that I talked about, and I apologize for any mispronunciations. And as John Bauer said in An Illustrated Treasury of Swedish Folk and Fairy Tales, quote, All this happened long ago, when there were trolls in the dark mountains and big dusky forests. Thanks so very much for listening. Good Yule and happy holidays, and may your spirits be merry and bright. And remember to keep your flashlights close, but your spooky art stories closer when visiting the Whispering Gallery.